Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's the day we can talk more about AMD's Ryzen 6000 mobile processors and provide performance benchmarks if we want to. Unfortunately though, we haven't yet received our review hardware, otherwise I'd be showing it to you right now. I'm supposed to be receiving an ASUS ROG Zephyrus G14, uh, but well, shipping delays being the way that it is these days, I haven't received it yet. But rest assured, we will have some performance data for you in hopefully, fingers crossed, a few days time, and we'll be doing a full breakdown comparing what should be the Ryzen 9 6980HS in, in this system when it arrives uh, to other mobile processors. Instead of leaving you guys with nothing today, I did want to provide a brief look at the Ryzen 6000 series APU architecture, and specifically to answer one key question that I think a lot of people had after first hearing about these processors. What exactly is the new Zen 3 Plus architecture? How does it differ compared to Zen 3? What are the potential performance gains on offer and where do they come from? So as AMD announced back at CES 2022, Ryzen Mobile 6000 is based on a new APU design that is a complete overhaul of their platform. Everything has been upgraded from new Zen 3 Plus CPU cores to RDNA 2 integrated graphics to DDR5 support and more. AMD's previous APUs have lagged a little behind in the features department, for example, only including PCIe 3.0 support and outdated Vega graphics. So this is a large redesign to bring Ryzen APUs up to speed with competitors like Intel 12th Gen. But of course, one of the big improvements here is the move from Zen 3 to Zen 3 Plus. AMD says this is a highly efficient core and that the Plus is all about efficiency. But what does this actually mean? So let's dive into what the Zen 3 Plus architecture is bringing. Essentially, all of the changes made to the Zen 3 Plus microarchitecture versus Zen 3 are focused on reducing energy consumption and optimizing for efficiency. AMD told us there are no fundamental IPC improvements with Zen 3 Plus compared to Zen 3, indicating that the fundamental building blocks of the CPU core, such as the micro-op queues, branch predictors, execution engine, ALUs, and so on, are all unchanged. We also see the same cache layout with 16 meg of L3 and 4 meg of L2. Where the differences lie is in how these CPU elements are managed and how optimized the design is. AMD lists a key feature of the Zen 3 Plus architecture as being design optimizations to reduce leakage, but the majority of the changes are to power management. More sleep states with deeper control over individual elements of the CPU architecture, such as the new CPPC per thread capability and an enhanced CC1 state to sleep cores when not utilized. Zen 3 Plus can also now delay L3 initialization among many other new features. AMD claims there are over 50 changes and we only got previewed on a handful of them. I'm sure there's a few secrets they want to keep in there as well. Key to achieving some of these goals is the shift from TSMC's N7 to N6 node, which provides an improvement in performance versus power thanks to the introduction of EUV layers in the manufacturing process. 6 nanometer isn't a massive step up over 7 nanometer. It's an iterative evolution on the same technology technology that assists AMD in enhancing performance per watt for Zen 3 Plus. But the efficiency enhancements don't stop with just the Zen 3 Plus CPU core, they extend to the entire SoC. These Ryzen 6000 APUs include better partitioning of various SoC components, such as the GPU and display engine, allowing for much tighter control over power. An example of this would be using a laptop that supports panel self-refresh. These new APUs have the ability to fully power off the display section of the APU when panel self-refresh is engaged, reducing power for that element potentially while the CPU is still being run at full power for, say, a background render or task. Of course, there are many other enhancements as well, such as improved clock gating, better current control methodologies, and new deep low power states. The key goal of many of these elements was to reduce power consumption substantially during extremely brief periods of rest, such as a single millisecond where the system isn't doing anything. Ensuring the system is consuming the minimum amount of power during any periods of rest helps to extend battery life. When you have new CPU and SOC architectures designed for efficiency, the goal is typically to improve battery life and performance per watt. AMD were throwing around numbers like 24 hours of battery life, but it's hard to know exactly what that means and in what context, like how the system was being used. In a more apples to apples comparison, AMD are claiming 8% longer battery life in Windows Idle, 12% in modern standby, and 17% in video playback, comparing 6,000U to 5,000U series processors at 15 watts. 
At CES, AMD also showed claims like 30% lower power consumption for video conferencing, 15% lower for Chrome browsing, and so on. I'm sure we'll see some test results for those claims shortly, as of course we shouldn't be taking manufacturers' claims uh, at their word. But this also throws up the question, well, the design is optimized for efficiency. Zen 3 Plus has no IPC improvements, and all the changes are to enhance performance per watt. So does performance actually improve this generation? And the answer, according to AMD, is yes, due to two factors. In optimizing for efficiency, AMD has improved performance per watt with Zen 3 Plus and Ryzen 6000 APUs. In power-constrained form factors like laptops, this doesn't typically reduce power usage. The chip will still run at, say, 15, 28, 45 watts, or whatever limit is set for that APU. So if the watts stay the same and performance per watt improves, what must get better? Well, it's performance, of course. For Ryzen Mobile 6000 and Zen 3 Plus, that's coming in the form of a clock speed increase. Again, no IPC changes, so the only realistic way to improve CPU performance is higher clocks. And we see that across the lineup. The Ryzen 7 6800U tops out at 4.7 GHz, up from 4.4 GHz, while the H series parts now hit 5 GHz, up from 4.8 GHz. 35 watt HS parts have higher base clocks as well, improved by up to 10%, while the U series gets up to a 40% bump. Based on the data AMD showed during their many presentations, it seems pretty clear that the performance gains from Ryzen 6000 and Zen 3 Plus are going to be larger at lower power limits. Shaving off half a watt makes a big difference at 15 watts, but a comparatively small difference at 45 watts. This is also a big reason why the Zen 3 Plus architecture isn't headed to the desktop as a mid-cycle refresh before Zen 4 arrives. Gains in performance per watt aren't as relevant in systems that push power and clocks to the absolute limit as is. Zen 3 Plus might have delivered better power consumption, but without gains to IPC, it just wasn't going to bring a huge jump in performance for those sorts of platforms. The changes present with Zen 3 to Zen 3 Plus are also quite a bit different to when Zen was upgraded into Zen Plus, and also play into why Zen 3 Plus isn't targeting desktop platforms. While Zen Plus did focus on improving efficiency and raising clock speeds, and like Zen 3 Plus it used a revised process node, Zen Plus also saw reductions in cache and memory latency, increased cache bandwidth, and several other features for a slim 3% jump in IPC, which combined with the higher clock ceiling for a respectable performance uplift. Zen 3 Plus doesn't appear to feature the same optimizations to things like cache, and as a result doesn't see higher IPC versus Zen 3. So that basically answers what Zen 3 Plus is and how it differs to AMD's previous architecture. It's clearly optimized for power, and that's why it's being used solely for these APUs targeting mobile form factors. But there are other features to Ryzen Mobile 6000 worth mentioning, so let's cover them. Obviously, a huge improvement is the use of RDNA 2 graphics, finally ditching the Vega compute units. Not going to go over the changes made in Navi versus previous designs, as we've talked about all that before when looking at prior RDNA and RDNA 2 GPUs, but clearly this is a huge leap in architecture, and it's not just an architectural change. The switch over to RDNA 2 for Ryzen 6000 brings with it more compute units, 12 versus 8, and we're now finally seeing more compute units than we got with the original range, of Zen Plus APUs that packed 11 compute units. The RDNA 2 GPU is available in two iGPU configurations, the Radeon 680M in Ryzen 7 and 9 APUs, or the Radeon 660M in Ryzen 5. Differences here being 12 versus 6 compute units and 2.4 versus 1.9 GHz clock speeds. AMD are claiming huge generational performance differences up to two times at higher power levels, but of course, we'll be able to test that soon. Other features worth talking about. DDR5 support. Ryzen Mobile 6000 exclusively uses DDR5 or LPDDR5X technology at up to 4800 and 6400 speeds respectively. So just to reiterate, no DDR4 support here, although most laptops would have used DDR5 anyway. This might increase laptop prices slightly compared to previous generation DDR4-based systems. However, we've been told from several OEMs that DDR5 supply and pricing to them is quite reasonable compared to the often horrific scenes we see for desktop modules, and DDR5 support is crucial for the performance gains seen with the new RDNA2 GPU. 
Ryzen Mobile 6000 supports USB 4, including all the bells and whistles like PCIe over USB, 240 watts of power delivery, various display protocols, and so on, depending on how the OEM implements the port. AMD's USB 4 ports will also support Thunderbolt devices, one of the crucial but optional features of the USB spec, although they're not advertising this capability just yet as they're still putting it through the certification process. However, once that finally comes through, assuming that it does, this will finally give AMD laptops Thunderbolt interoperability for the first time. The display engine supports HDMI 2.1 at up to 48 gigabits per second, the full HDMI 2.1 spec, and DisplayPort 2 up to 40 gigabits per second, the second from highest DisplayPort 2 configuration. So this is UHBR10, not UHBR20, but I don't think we'll see UHBR20 for some time. And it is the first time that we've seen a device support uh, DisplayPort 2 outputs. And up to four display outputs are supported as well, which is more than the standalone discrete Radeon RX 6500 XT. GPU. The Media Engine has been upgraded to support AV1 decoding and VCN 3.1, which is actually a step newer than VCN 3.0, which we get with Navi 2 GPUs based on RDNA 2. This is a massive improvement over prior APUs, which only used VCN 2.x and didn't support emerging tech like AV1. Combined with the much faster iGPU, this should lead to large gains in hardware accelerated apps like Adobe Premiere. PCIe 4.0 is supported in an 8-lane configuration for discrete graphics. This is an improvement over the PCIe 3.0 we got previously, and as such doubles the provided bandwidth. However, it's not the move up to x16 lanes that I think many would have liked to see. Despite this, Intel 12th Gen mobile parts also support just PCIe 4.0x8, so there's no difference there between the two main CPU providers. And finally, we have support for Ondai Active Noise Cancellation in a low power state and Microsoft's Pluton Security Processor. So that's a quick overview of what AMD's Ryzen 6000 series APUs are looking like from an architecture standpoint and the features they have provided. Hopefully this also gives some clarity into what exactly Zen 3 Plus is and why it's unlikely to come to desktop platforms before Zen 4 arrives. We'll be back in a few days, maybe a week with performance data from what? what I should have had here, a new laptop from ASUS, which is going to be using a Ryzen 9 HS series APU. And we'll of course be comparing that to all sorts of other chips that we've been testing. We'll throw in some Apple M1 data, we'll throw in some 12th gen data, and of course previous generation stuff as well, comparing across a range of performance benchmarks and all that sort of thing. But just for now, a brief update on some of the architectural changes that have been made in AMD's Ryzen 6000 series. So anyway, that's it for this video. Bit of a brief one, bit of a news video, which we don't often do on the channel. If you're interested in supporting us, we do have our Patreon float plan accounts. Links to those are in the description below. You'll get access to things like monthly live streams, Discord chat, uh, behind the scenes videos, all sorts of good stuff. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.